Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started. Welcome to the Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Ticketmaster. My name is Sam Fetter. I'm a second year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to introduce this next CA talk, How the Predators Turn Data into Value. So please join me in welcoming our presenter, the COO of the Nashville Predators, Michelle Kennedy. Thank you, Sam. Hi, guys. They cleaned up my title a little bit. Not my title. The t oh, there we go. Data's role in an unapologetically irreverent organization, how it works in Smashville. I think they put a different title up there so maybe some of you guys would show up, because what the hell does that mean? Um, but let me tell you, I'm, I'm very transparent. I want to, in the interest of full disclosure, let me tell you what I am not going to talk about. I am not going to talk about numbers. I'm not going to talk about regression analyses. You're not going to hear algorithm coming out of my, out of my mouth again. So if that upsets most of you, you, you may leave. I will, you will not hurt my feelings. Um, I, you can see that today has been a conference, I've sat in, in a lot of sessions, conference full of data, full of a lot of very deep dives into things. Um, sort of like you've been sitting around all day reading The Economist. You could regard this as getting in your bag and trying to get the next Economist out, but getting a People magazine instead. So I hope that you'll learn a little something but um, again, in the interest of full disclosure, we're not going to take a real deep dive into a lot of data. I'm going to explain to you guys how we use data in our organization and how I believe it is most beneficial. So in order to do that, I think what, I, what we believe is the fundamental premise of data is that without context, culture, and integration, data is just data. So in order to bring some of that to light, I have to offer a little bit of of the historical context of the National Predators organization. I've got to talk to you a little bit about our culture, and I've got to give you some examples of how we integrate data into our culture. So I'm going to start with this. And I will tell you that I have been with the Predators for about 11 years. So I've lived through a lot of these things I'm about to tell you about with, with respect to the historical context. And I suffer from a little bit of PTSD sometimes because of them. So. I, I, will, I will get through this, but if I get a little bit shaky, it's because I'm remembering things that I'd like to forget. So in 1997, we were an expansion team. So now we are about 20 years old and um, are still in Nashville against all odds. Capital infusions. From the beginning of time until about five years ago, there were always capital calls in this organization. Um, and it was something that, quite frankly, the owners who bought in in 2007 didn't quite count on. They thought that this was a nice little community investment. They'd throw in whatever the initial investment was, and then they never have to worry about it again. And it turned out to be vastly different than that. So um, every, there, was a cap, there were capital calls, extensive capital calls, every year from inception. And only over the last five years have those ended. So that's much better. Location. Um, there was a real and present danger of the, of the Preds moving to Canada in 2007. It was so real and present, as a matter of fact, that in Hamilton, Ontario, there was a website, or there was a building, that began to profess that it was going to be the home of the Predators. There were season tickets on sale online for the Hamilton Predators. And then a group of largely local investors came in and decided that they were going to buy the Nashville Predators. Bring us to modern day. Um, the team is really the toast of Nashville. Our, our city loves us. We love our city. Um, so it's been a huge, huge change from about 10 years ago. Felonies. Why would felonies be on this presentation? Well, this one was a particular, particularly awful brand of hell for me. Um, shortly after the 2007 purchase, one owner, actually it was a guy who was not a local owner, it doesn't really matter but because the things were just as bad, uh, but he declared bankruptcy and ended up in federal prison because it just so happened that the money he used to buy the Predators was fraudulently obtained. He colluded with a broker, and they, they stole someone else's money, and that's the money he used to buy the Predators. So the really special thing about that was that he owned a special kind of unit share in the Predators whereby he had to approve anything that happened. So if we wanted to make a, a player acquisition, if we wanted to do anything, we had to deal with this guy who was in federal prison. So actually, we're dealing with this bankruptcy trustee who isn't really aligned with our objectives as a, as a hockey franchise. So it was pretty awful. We don't have any owners in prison now. Small victories. Um, financial stability. 
We struggled for a long, long time to even hit the minimum paid attendance that was mandated by the CBA in the, in the not, cur not now current, but the previous CBA of the NHL. And I am pleased to report that earlier this week, we just had our 143rd consecutive sellout. So vastly different. Our internal operation was very siloed. We, um, we, our, our ownership's management group owns the team, and they also own the company that runs the arena. The city owns the arena, but we do all, all of what goes on in the arena. But back then, we were very siloed. It was arena versus team. It was hockey versus business. We were very, very siloed. Now we live by what we call a strategy called one goal, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about what that means as we, as we go on. Um, so things have changed from vastly in the last 10 years, the last 10 or 11 years. Um, we have nearly doubled our number of FSEs to the point that we now have a waiting list for season ticket holders, and we have more, we have more than doubled our ticket revenue during the span of time. So while many of you are parts of organizations that you know, think that you know, the National Predators are no big deal. It's the contrast in where we were and where we are now that, we, that we're, the, we're most proud of. So I'll breeze past this slide because you guys like to take pictures and then have some sensitive information. Um, this is what Smashville looks like now. We've got gold smoke plume, plumes coming up. We've got gold people filling the place every single time we open it up. I did not put a picture of what it looked like in 2007 because it's just too depressing. So how did we get, how did Smashville become a destination? How did, we, how did we change these things? A number of different things. One is just the natural maturity of Nashville as a hockey market. We're 20 years old now. There are more people there who know more about hockey than they did 10 or 15 years ago. So some of it comes from that. Um, part of what we have really focused on a lot in the last 10 or 11 years, in large part because it, we were such a flight risk. We were on sale in Hamilton as the Hamilton Predators. Um, we, ha we have really, really focused on community integration and on taking a customer-first approach. I sat in a, in a session a little bit earlier today about how do you re retain your fans when your team isn't that good. And in 2007, as you look through all those things about your fan experience and all that, I think we were probably pretty terrible at most of those things. Um, we have made a concerted effort to be much, much better at those things, and we think, we think we've done a pretty good job at that. We had a couple key leverage opportunities that helped a great deal. We hosted the NHL All-Star Game in 2016, and it was just, it was, everything came together beautifully. Our city showed so well. We have said so many times that Nashville used to be a really well-kept secret. Um, and there are a number of things that make that not so today. This was, this was one of them, at least in hockey. The players who were playing in the All-Star Game had such a great time. The NHL office told us what a wonderful, t I mean, it just show, it showed so well. And Mother Nature was even in on it. The weekend before, we had about six inches of snow in Nashville. And, and I know in Boston, that's no big deal. But that paralyzes Nashville for like a week. So we were mortified. We thought, oh my gosh, the, we're not even going to have a game. Nobody's going to be able to get here. The next weekend, it was 70, 70 degrees and sunny the entire weekend. So everybody, including Mother Nature, was in on it. And then in, in 2017, we had the good fortune of, while being the last team to qualify for the playoffs, we were also the last team to lose in the playoffs. Um, so we went all the way to the Stanley Cup final, and we used those two opportunities as key leverage opportunities to, to create additional season ticket holders. Um, and we'll talk some more about this, the integration of data analytics into organizational mainstream. But probably the biggest of all these is ownership's commitment to competitive success. I only touched on one small grid, and all you know is that we just had one owner in prison. You don't know all the other stories, but there were some. And so these guys, at, one, at a point in time around 2010, 2011, decided, you know what? It's not enough to just own this as a nice community asset. We are going to, to ensure that we have competitive success. And we know that that's going to create, for us, a lot of expenditure, but it's worth it because it's a matter of pride, and that's what we should be here to do. So I'm going to go through some, what some of our guys, our owners did. So what did our ownership do? Our ownership, what did our ownership do? What were the issues, and how did they respond? One of the issues was a commitment to competitiveness. We had been that team who had always kind of made its way into the playoffs by hook and crook. How in the world did you do it? You're, you've, you've got a player payroll near the floor. How are you, how are you getting there? So David Poyle was the magician that, that helped it happen every year. But what they decided was we don't want it to be just dumb luck anymore. We want to invest in a way that makes us reasonably competitive every year, and, and that it should, be ex, it should be expected. So there was a key ac one key acquisition and one key player retention that I'll talk about in a couple slides that really demonstrated that commitment for our owners. 
the fear of flight risk that I talked to you about before. Um, we had to become a core part of our community. We had to make our community love us as much as we loved being there. And so we have, our, our Predators Foundation does wonderful, wonderful work, and our city has uh, become very fond of us. These next two I'm going to talk about together because they sort of are part and parcel to one another. Get the red out. At the time that we began this initiative, our two primary rivals were the Red Wings and the Blackhawks. Both had a lot of red, and, our, and their, their fans loved to come to Nashville and watch games. Um, so what happened in those instances was that our guys, who we, who we were saying, we're making a commitment to your competitiveness. We're going to do everything we can to help you guys win every game. They go out on the ice for especially those two games, and it seems that they're, in a, they're not in a home venue. There's more red there than there is any other color, and at that time we didn't really have an, a, a, an identifiable color that was very prominent. So our chairman at the same time, uh, along with the ownership group, decided, you know what, we're going to manage our tickets in a different way so that we can get the red out, and we're going to create an identity for ourselves, and I'll talk about that on the next slide as well. <clears throat> the internal silos were broken down, and it became our, our very vocal and very out front interest to to be a unified organization. So, so what does that mean? One goal, what, the, the slide is on the next page, but it basically it means that we all work for one thing. Whether we're the GM of the organization or the GM of our public ice facility 20 miles away, we are all there for each other. There was no more building team hockey business um, and we all became one aligned organization. I'll give you some examples of how that happened. It, we didn't just snap our fingers and make it happen. Unapologetically irreverent. That's what we call our culture. That's what we say that we are. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of silly things sometimes. It means that somebody in the history of our organization decided instead of the answer to the Red Wings throwing an octopus on the, on the ice was us throwing catfish on the ice. So we just embrace it. We have a catfish tank in our, in our building. We have Gil and Ben. Our, our, we, have cat, we have pet catfish. Um, we have... We love to celebrate our successes. It's not at all unusual on a Friday afternoon, if we've had a few events in a row, to have a beer cart rolling around the office, just to have a, a, a nice, fun time for a little bit. Um, we, we took lots of grief on social media about how many banners we put up at the, end of, at the beginning of the season. And we loved it. We're good-natured. We, we just got an office dog, and we named him Lord Banner of Smashville. So, you know, it's just part of, of being fun. We do hockey our way, and we don't necessarily subscribe to, we don't do it to be um, hurtful, we don't do, be, do it to be um, ma malicious, we just like to do hockey our way and we talk about being unapologetically irreverent. Gold Nation orientation. This is an, or, this is an actual orientation that we do. When, our, when employees begin to work for us, the executive staff has a meeting with them and we call it Gold Nation orientation. We talk about a lot of the things I'm talking about today. We talk about our culture. We talk about our foundation and how it's as important a part of what we do as anything else. It's as important as playing hockey. It's as important as anything we do. So all these things feed into the one goal philosophy. Get the red out and, and goldenization. How did we do that? We began geogating our ticket sales, and we eliminated brokers almost in one fell swoop. And the, the time that this started, I can't remember the, the year, but I do remember it was right around the time that we were playing the, red, uh, the uh, Blackhawks in a playoff game. And our owners were so committed to this that we were giving away free tickets to those games rather than selling them to fans outside of our geographic area. I mean, this cost, these, these initiatives, um, the Get the Red Out and Goldenization, we put gold everywhere. I mean, our whole place is so gold. We spent so much money on gold paint, I can't even tell you. Um, but these two initiatives cost our owners millions of dollars. That's how committed they were to making those things happen. This is one goal. Bridgestone Arena is the number one sports and entertainment venue in the United States, and it, it's stated aspirationally. And its centerpiece is the Stanley Cup champion National, National Predators hockey team. That thing was created in 2010. And when our chairman started chirping about that, he sounded like a crazy person. It was 2010. We had just come out of these awful, awful times where we weren't even, maybe, weren't, maybe weren't, weren't going to be in Nashville. But now, 10, 11 years later, we've been Arena of the Year a number of times. We've made it to the Stanley Cup final one time, and we hope to do it a lot more times. Not the final to win it. Um, but it seems a lot more reasonable now than it did then. So one goal at work. What is, how, do, how, is one, how does one goal work? Um, solid business strategy is always the driver. 
I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. I'm, my time is running short. Uh, we, use, we use data to integrate business and hockey. And one of the things I'm going to tell you about in just a second is building business cases based on player rosters. Um, analytics are used to refine, validate, or improve ideas. Analytics and data don't drive what we do. They validate, improve, or refine it. And then we integrate our data analytics folks in our strategy sessions, our marketing sessions, because without that, without that context, you know, someone, I heard someone else say in another session that we're drowning in data. And we are, unless we, unless we make it uh, operational in this way. And then the other thing that we have to do is be nimble to evolve and respond to changing circumstances. We've had a lot of changing circumstances. If you told us five years ago that we'd have a season ticket waiting list, I'm not sure we would have believed you. But that creates some different challenges than we've had to deal with in the past. So here's, here are a couple fun examples of early examples of data driving decisions based on strategy. Back in the day, it used to be the case that whatever the hockey player payroll budget was, it was. And if, he, if our GM had an opportunity to do something that would extend beyond the parameters of that budget, there's just no, you just didn't do it. So one day, off the cuff, he was talking to our CEO about the opportunity to acquire Mike Fisher. You guys may not know Mike Fisher, but you probably know Mike Fisher's wife, Carrie Underwood. So at the time, they had either just gotten married or were about to get married, and Carrie's home is in Nashville, sort of by necessity, and Mike and Carrie wanted to be in the same town. So there was an opportunity for us to acquire Mike, but it was going to extend beyond the parameters of our budget. So our GM came into our CEO's office and said, I wish we could do this. I mean, it would be great for so many reasons, but I can't. And our CEO was like, why? And the CEO was relatively new at that time. He said, why can't you do that? Said, well, it's just not in the budget. I can't do it. He said, well, no, we need to build a business case for why it makes sense to acquire Mike Fisher. And our GM, who had lived in this system for a long, long time, was like, I don't think that's going to work. So we did it. We, we created the business case. We convinced our owners. And Mike Fisher became a member of the National Predators. He was a great member of the National Predators. He was a great captain. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing for our hockey team, for our city. Um, so that was one of the very early, early examples in our organization of using data in a way that was integrated into the, enti the strategy of the entire um, organization. The second time it happened was about a year later when there was a pretty gigantic offer sheet that Shea Weber signed. Um, and it, when I first saw it, I, I mean, this, the little Nashville Predators, my goodness, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the details of the offer sheet, but it was brutal. It was huge. Um, and so the, the unfortunate, the most unfortunate part, at least personally, it felt like at the time, was that that happened on the night before I was leaving for vacation. I always will refer to my vacation of 2012 in a lovely home on Rosemary Beach as my shaycation because I sat in that damn house for days and ran models to help us get to the point of deciding whether we should or shouldn't keep Shea Weber. So we did keep Shea Weber. And again, another example of integrating data into your strategic decisions in order to make good things happen. I'm going to blow through these because I'm getting really short on time. We do multiple year season tickets. It's just another example of strategy in Smashville. We, it, it engenders loyalty for the base. Uh, we know it may result in leaving a little money on the table, but it provides some stability in, in, in times of financial downturn, and it gives our, our mostly the intangible of engendering loyalty for our, our season ticket holder base is our, is our primary driver for that. Another thing that we did recently, we created an incentive for half plan upgrades by limiting their access to playoff tickets. We did that the year after the Stanley Cup final run, so everybody is very, very excited about uh, playoffs in Nashville. And so it, it resulted in 1,000 half plan accounts upgrading to full three-year plans. Um, whoops, wrong way. Change circumstances. Let me run through this one real quick. Um, so what happened, now that we have a sold-out season ticket capacity, it creates the issues of the show rate is diminished, and there aren't as many opportunities to introduce new fans to the game, which in a relatively new hockey market remains very, very important. So we have created this give back rollback program, whereby if our season ticket holders give back three tickets from their season ticket package, we'll ro roll back their season ticket price for the next season. And this does a few things for us. It enables us to generate additional revenue at higher single game ATP, because we obviously recycle those tickets. Um, it enables us to continue to reach new fans, which is really, really important for us for, our, for sustaining the models that we have in place. It addresses the show rate issues, and it creates a new benefit for season ticket holders. But what if you're a season ticket holder when we often find that 
giving back three tickets is great, but I'd like to get rid of four or five or eight. So we've created what we call a seventh man marketplace. It's a geo-gated secondary market. As I said before, the Get the Red Out was such an important initiative to us um, that the secondary market creates some challenges for that. So we have worked with Ticketmaster to create this secondary market ticket secondary market geo-gated marketplace such that our season ticket holders can now go in and go beyond those, those three that they can give back and, um, and make even, give even more value for their season ticket package. I'm going to talk real fast. I know it's at five minutes. Um, so boom, boom, boom. You guys probably all do all this stuff. It's great. Um, our, our, our analytics guys meet with marketing. They, they track the success of our digitally placed ads. It's cool. It's why you need to integrate. Because if marketing never talks to analytics, what are you really going to get out of it? So here are the things that I think are the most important of all that I've said. You've got to buy. How do you make senior leadership embrace the value of data? You have to buy into your company culture. I've, I've been on so many interviews with data analytics folks where they, they frame themselves as a consultant. I don't want a consultant in this spot. I want someone who's as invested in our operation as I am. So don't do that. Don't be a consultant. Be a, be a team member. Invest in the culture. Um, and acknowledge the value of the qualitative insight that your, your colleagues can provide. Yes, you know the numbers. You know the data. But someone else knows strategy. Someone else knows all that. It's, it's when data and experience come together that you're best. You're going to get your best result. Um, main takeaways, the assimilation and reporting of data does not make an organization great. People and culture make an organization great. Assimilation and reporting of data can make a great organization better, but those aren't the foundations. The pillars of it are the people and the culture. And then the strategy-based analytics. You've got to integrate your analytics department into the mainstream of the operation. Otherwise, you're not going to maximize either of those. I've got three minutes and 38 seconds, so I, I, I failed at my mission to stop at five. But what questions do you have? None? Yes? Yeah, we have, um, so we built the first, um, the first community ice facility in partnership with the city. It's open from 5 a.m. until 1 a.m. most days. We're in the process of building a second one. And as we, uh, we already have the first year of programming booked for tournaments and all that kind of stuff. So it is very, very busy. We have a, a woeful inadequacy of ice in Nashville. And it's one of our, one of our objectives to continue to build those, those centers all around the area. Well, he, he's a great example because, as I said, it's very important to us that our, our foundation is a cornerstone of everything that we do. So without prompting him, without saying, okay, PK, here's what we want you to do, when PK, back when the, when the national anthem kneeling and all that discussion was going on in the NHL, NFL, PK was asked, was the first person on our team, as you might imagine, who was asked about that. His response to it was excellent. It was not... You know, his response was, I'm creating this program called Blue Line Buddies. And what this program does is it brings inner city youth together with police officers so that they can get to know each other so that there's not that, that weirdness that exists in those groups. And that program has taken off and been just a wonderful, wonderful program for us. So what we find is that our GM, we are so, everyone is so bought into this one goal culture our GM will go out and try to find people who fit in our organization. You know, we, there were people that we have decided not to pursue as players because we didn't feel like they would fit in our organization. But by with that one example, I mean, PK has done a great job at fitting in with those things, and he's, he's wonderful with our foundation. Yes? Have you found that your one goal initiatives around your company culture has indirectly allowed yourself to bring in more sponsors, or um, does that come off as kind of you know, it may come off as fake. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think it does because, you know, we sit in that meet, that first meeting that we have with our, with our staff, and I'll say it to this group, to any other group I speak to, what we say to them is, here's what we are. We're not making it up. We're not going to apologize for it. It's deliberate. It's not accidental. If you don't like it, if, if you don't feel like this is going to be the place for you, then, and it, 
probably is a little rude of the COO on the first day to invite them to leave, but I say, if this, is, if, if you, if this doesn't resonate with you, you probably aren't going to be happy here. And I don't mean this in a mean way, but I'll, we'll help you find another place to be because you spend way too much time here to not be happy. Um, you know, I think that does the one goal. I think the one goal culture permeates everything that we do. So the way that it would affect a sponsor, for instance, we're having a sponsor summit next week, our first ever sponsor summit. Peter Laviolette's coming. Three or four players are coming. I mean, if we didn't have that one goal culture, I think we'd get a lot of that if we asked people to come. With, you know, so I think in that way it's impactful. Um, we don't directly sell that one goal culture to our sponsors, but it's evident in what we do with things like that. Sorry. If I'm, Censored. I need to be censored. Yeah. 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 I mean, Nashville's a huge, huge draw for for our free agents. But um, you know, as I said when we were talking about PK, David's not going to go out and find someone. I like the Preds. Oh, props to you. Um, David's not going to go out and find someone who he knows isn't going to fit in that culture. And so. You know, our guys will, and, and you're going to think I'm making this up, and you can. You don't have to believe me. It doesn't matter. Um, but when, when we have our, the, our children's hospital visits, our guys, you know, the young guys will sign up for it. The older guys will say, no, you're not going there. We, we, I mean, they fight over, where, in a pleasant way, over who's going to go to the children's hospital and do that work. You know, it, this isn't, it's not something, it's not the arms that we twist. It's not anything that we do that we're not overlords about it. We just are also bought into this culture that we bring people along who, um, who, who, all, who fit. All right, one more. Yes. Oh, I'll give you JT Louvier's number and you can call him and ask him. <laughs> one more that, that I can actually answer. You. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. How did the salary cap management go? It's math. <laughs> we figured it out. Yes. What advice would you give us uh, to us, like as new um, and kind of enter the sports industry, like for a skill set or something to work on or something that's just like? When you, it's a couple things that I said, and it's that when you're doing your interviews. Don't position yourself as a consultant. And I don't know why that happens. And, and again, I'm not trying to be the cool kid. I'm an accountant and a lawyer, for God's sakes. I, I should make uh, all of you data folks feel better about yourselves. But don't be a consultant. That's not what we want. We don't want a consultant. Don't throw around a bunch of acronyms that don't mean that much to everybody that you're talking to. If you're talking to JT Louvier, he's our director of, of data analytics, talk to him about it. But don't talk to me. Don't talk to our CEO. Be, be someone that demonstrates that they can fit into our culture and that they have a passion for what they do and that they have a passion for our organization. Don't send me a resume with a cover letter that tells me how great the Pelicans are because you forgot to change them. You know, I mean, just kind of pretty basic stuff. All right, I'm, I, I've, I've got to stop. I'll be outside after this if anybody wants to continue with this irreverence. But thank you.